everyone. Uh, welcome to this environmental uh, research seminar. Uh, I am Song Yun Park, uh, a faculty member of uh, Epidemiology and Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, this seminar series is sponsored by the Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease Center, in short, um, MLEAD. And uh, I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Luke Montrose. Dr. Montrose is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences, Colorado State University. He received a PhD in environmental toxicology from the University of Montana. And then, uh, as some of you know, uh, he did his postdoc training here in uh, University of Michigan. So working with uh, Dr. Dana Darlinoy. So welcome back. Um, Dr. Montrose is an environmental toxicologist with research interest in public health, epigenetics, and chronic illness, particularly as it relates to vulnerable and understudied population. Dr. Montrose's research portfolio reflects his passion for studying human health through multiple lenses, ranging from community health to molecular biology. So today, Dr. Montrose will share his recent work on wildfire smoke exposure, which is very important these days due to, uh, you know, wildfire uh, in uh, you know West Coast and uh, adverse health outcome beyond the lungs. So please join me uh, on welcoming Dr. Montrose. Slides up. Looks good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, it is wonderful to be back, even if uh, virtual. Uh, and so thank you for the invite uh, to speak. And thank you. I quickly looked through the attendee list and I saw a lot of familiar names. And so uh, I feel well, well supported. And this, uh, this feels, um, feels like it'll be a good talk. Uh, so I wanted to just say what a privilege it is to come back and speak uh, to you all. Uh, and um, I'm gonna um, talk today about wildfire smoke exposure and adverse health outcomes. And what I'm gonna try to convince you of is that uh, as wildfire smoke exposures become more common, uh, we need to look at organs outside of the traditional target organs uh, or organ being the lung. And also uh, the heart gets a lot of notoriety as well. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that of that by the end. Um, I'm going to try to start from the, the end, actually, and I want to make sure that I say thank you to everyone who made this work possible. Um, so folks from the University of Montana, Boise State, University of Michigan, Northeastern University, and then a slew of students uh, there on the right-hand side have contributed to this work. And so in my lab, uh, we, we have kind of two main goals. We want to work in the lab and we want to identify biomarkers and mechanisms. We want to determine the influence that wildfire smoke has on disease risk. But we also want to take that research into the field and we want to be able to communicate that science to those vulnerable and understudied folks in the uh, community who are at risk. And uh, uh, ultimately, we want to improve their, their health. And so I group my uh, science approach into kind of three buckets, and this is a cell to society approach. As you heard from the introduction, I uh, am, am sort of a, a, a broad scientist uh, working in the lab, working in the field, uh, doing a lot of different things, all having to do with wildfire smoke. And so I'm going to use this sort of timeline or these three buckets to guide the talk today. And it wouldn't be a public health talk if we didn't first frame this public health problem. Uh, I think um, it's already been said that wildfire activity is increasing. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is, is that it's it's not actually the number of, of fires. So that's the dark red in the background. And we can see that it's oscillating over time, but it's not really trending up or down. Uh, what is trending up is the number of acres burned. And we can see that from this graphic that some of the most intense fire years have been in recent memory. And I think we'll all probably remember the 2020 fire season where smoke from California, Washington, Oregon, not only went to you know, the West, Idaho, Colorado, it went to Michigan, New York, and all the way over into Europe. And so 
Um, when fires burn like that, uh, everyone is impacted, not just the West. Um, where there's fire, there's smoke. And so one of the main things that we're kind of worried about is this shift in the way or the type of particulate that we're exposed to as a U.S. population. And because of prudent government regulation, we can see that on the right side of this um, graph, the blue or purple is good. It means we're heading in the right direction. We see a change in the negative direction of the type of, uh, of, of the level of pollution that we're exposed to. But on the left side of the United States, we actually see the opposite, where we're getting worse. And so um, this study shows that it's mostly due to wildfire smoke exposure. Um, and because traffic-related air pollution is going down and wildfire smoke pollution is going up, over time, we're going to see a shift uh, um, in the relative amount of this pollution. It's going to shift towards most of the particulate that we're exposed to as a U.S. population is actually going to come from a wildfire smoke source. And so that means as researchers, we need to shift our focus uh, to this. We know a lot about urban air pollution and its health effects. We know far less about wildfire smoke. What is in the smoke? Uh, this is a very complicated question. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands of uh, compounds can be found in smoke, and it really depends on what's burning, where it's burning, and how it's burning. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, but I want to draw your attention to some of the common compounds that we find in smoke as particulate matter, um, oxides of nitrogen, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and Thinking specifically about particulate matter, we're really concerned with the really small particulate matter. So PM 2.5, 2.5 micrometers in aerodynamic diameter. And that's because this gets deep into the lungs and it can actually cause problems with the way that oxygen gets from the lung and into the blood, um, whether that's direct blockage or through inflammation. But either way, I like oxygen in my body. I'm sure you do too. Smoke can prevent that from getting there. Um, and so the EPA recognizes that particulate matter is important, and they've made it one of their six criteria pollutants, and they've actually come up with a, a guideline for, uh, or a standard, 35 micrograms per meter cubed for a 24-hour period. That number may not ring true for you uh, in, in that graphic, but it probably will in this graphic. Um, you've, we've all seen the air quality index pop up on our weather apps or on, on the TV uh, during while we're watching the weather. Um, 35 micrograms per meter cubed is that point at which it changes from yellow to orange or from moderate to unhealthy for sensitive groups. And so we all recognize that number, even if you even if you didn't know that it was specifically the, the uh, EPA NAC uh, for PM 2.5. So we're interested in smoke as it relates to uh, public health because it causes a lot of acute uh, exposure concerns, things like hot, uh, increased hospital visits. Um, it can, uh, people with asthma or COPD, it can cause exacerbations. It can cause inflammatory responses. And it typically happens that it uh, is really uh, impactful for these vulnerable populations that I've listed um, on the right. Um, I also want to you know, tell you that there's some chronic exposure concerns that we're that we've been interested in. The top three are are ones that are more traditional. So, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. I'm trying to convince you, though, by the end of the uh, talk today, that we should include brain health and reproductive health on this list as well. And there's definitely some um, evolving literature uh, around this, and this is all part of a new conversation uh, that's happening right now. For the students in the in the audience right now, I kind of wanted to have a little thought exercise uh, on this, and this is what I do as a researcher, um, and this is what I've recently been asked to do um, as a member of the the uh, medical and public health advisory team. Uh, it used to be that CDC, NIOSH, U.S. Forest Service, and Department of the Interior made up this group, but they've recently reached out to me and asked me to be part of this uh, this team. And so now academics are uh, are represented here. And the idea is, how should wildfire smoke and its health effects be studied into the future? Um, and, how, and how should government agencies look to fund these? What are the priorities? So these are some of the questions that I sit in my office and ask myself is, you know, what type of a human cohort would we want? Should we use animal models? And if so, what kinds of animal models? A really important question that I'm going to come back to later on is, 
who are the controls if if pretty much everyone has some background level of air pollution exposure, even specifically wildfire smoke exposure? How do you find controls for this type of experiment? Um, what are the target organs? Should we be looking at community exposures or occupational exposures? And if you're going to do an animal model, which of those are you modeling? Um, and then we have all of these terms that get thrown around that around the type of exposure paradigm. Should it be you know, acute high dose, chronic low dose. There's these new terms called episodic chronic. Essentially, you're getting exposed for a month or two out of the year, every year for your entire life. Um, and how do we uh, weigh the benefits of things like prescribed fires? If prescribed fires add to um, these chronic exposures where people may be exposed throughout the entire year because of either wildfires, prescribed burns, or uh, wood stoves in their communities. Um, and then this is that point that I made earlier, that a fire isn't a fire isn't a fire. It all depends on the fuel source, the burn temperature, the exposure distance, the weather. So all of this is very complicated, but that, that shouldn't prevent us from thinking about how to do it well as, as researchers. Um, and so this is just a thought exercise. There's no, there's no answer that I want from anyone right now, but these are things that I think about, and I'd like the students to just ponder this as well. So uh, what, what I'm going to talk about here for the next little bit is the biomarkers and associated mechanisms of wildfire smoke health effects and how I study this using um, an occupational exposure paradigm uh, and using uh, a mouse model to do that. Um, and the idea here is to uh, help protect the health of vulnerable and under understudied populations here, in this case, being wildland firefighters. So let's talk just for a second about wildland firefighters and, and just say that even among firefighters, their exposures are, um, are varied. Uh, there was a recent publication by Reinhardt and Broyles that looked at a lot of these different types of firefighters and showed that depending on the work that you do throughout the day, that is what kind of drives the type of exposure that you have. And so these are just images of different types of firefighters. And then I have some of the names of firefighters listed there um, to the right. Now, I would, limp, I would kind of lump all of these guys together and gals together as wildland firefighters. And we need to kind of juxtapose wildland firefighters with structure or structural firefighters. And um, we know a lot more about structure firefighters for a lot of reasons. Um, they have structured work schedules. They're pretty easy to find and recruit. Uh, they work on short-lived fires and they have um, you know, a, a standard uh, job task that they do. Whereas wildland firefighters historically are much harder to follow. They're seasonal workers typically uh, they're working long-lived fires, but kind of sporadic. Uh, and these guys use guys and gals definitely use different PPE. We can see from the image um, that the structure firefighter actually is wearing a mask. He's going to be getting his uh, oxygen uh, supplied to to them, but uh, the wildland firefighter has far fewer uh, protective equipment available to them because of the nature of their job. So. We kind of need to lay some foundation of like what's going on in the wildland firefighter field of research, what's known, what's not known. Um, if we look at firefighters uh, in, the, in the literature, Adentona uh, has done a nice review and found that there's cross-shift differences, cross-season differences that they can find in lung function. And also during a, a shift, we see acute systemic inflammation in these firefighters. And this um, according to a, a great researcher from the University of Montana, Aaron Simmons, uh, can infer some uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, Kat Navarro from CDC NIOSH has done some great work to model uh, lung cancer risk uh, among these uh, firefighters as well. And if we go out and we survey these folks, what are they most interested in or what are they most worried about? Mental health issues uh, continue to come up among the firefighter community as being something that they're really um, interested to know more about. And then this last bit here is what's kind of going to motivate the, the, the next story I'm going to tell uh, about extrapulmonary effects or things outside of the lung. Why do we think that that's possible? It's that inflammatory piece. And it's what happens when the inflammation kind of spills out uh, of the lung and goes into circulation and has access uh, to all of the organs. 
before I get too far into this, I need to give a quick epigenetics primer because my work is going to be, uh, for this story, is going to be epigenetics focused. And I want to make sure that we all have at least a, a, a foundation of knowledge about what epigenetics is and why this is important. Um, so in our bodies, uh, we have uh, a, uh, we have DNA. And that DNA is a composite of things given to you by your mother and your father. And all of these different tissues all use the same uh, genetic code, A, C's, T's, and G's. They're all the same. And yet we have all of these different tissues all having the same DNA. What makes them able to do their individual job? A brain cell is obviously very different than a sperm cell or a liver cell. And it's the epigenome. The epigenome is unique in each one of uh, these tissue types. And so that's very important for us to, to recognize. Um, epigenetic alterations are therefore biologically necessary. Uh, but if they occur at the wrong time or the wrong place, they can influence disease risk. Um, and so they need to fit into three criteria to be an epigenetic mark. They need to be non-genetic. So this isn't cancer. This isn't a mutation. We're not changing the ACTs and Gs. Um, but so it is non-genetic. It can alter uh, the way that genes uh, function or their activity. Um, they need to be modifiable or reversible, at least in theory. And they need to be heritable. Here, heritability means through cell lineage, not necessarily across uh, generations of organism. Um, there's some main types of epigenetic marks, DNA methylation, histone modifications, and RNA. And you're going to hear me talk about DNA methylation uh, for the purposes of this talk. And canonically, if we uh, add a lot of DNA methylation, we're going to get that uh, the picture on the right-hand side, lower portion, where the DNA coils up and is less accessible, uh, less activity. If you remove DNA methylation, the you uncoil the DNA, you have more um, accessibility and you have more, more likelihood of transcription um, and translation. And so kind of think of this as being, if you add methylation, you turn the light off. If you take it away, you turn the light on. And I just want to throw in a quick piece of information here. I, I normally throw this in when I'm talking to my K through 12 students because they like this example. What environmental exposures do we know of that cause um, epigenetic change? Um, and so one of those that's really biologically relevant is in honeybees. Uh, uh, DNA methylation is what controls whether or not you're going to become a queen bee or a worker bee. And so we have some really salient examples of how environment influences DNA methylation uh, and um, influences uh, our biology. And so this is all to say that epigenetics, we think, is going to be an important, could be an important factor specifically for wildfire smoke exposures. And so that's going to be what we're going to kind of start looking at here when we look at extrapulmonary effects is looking at these extrapulmonary tissues and trying to see if there's DNA methylation differences uh, that occur following an environmental exposure, in this case, smoke exposure. So this is that story that I told you a little bit about earlier. I'm going to try to illuminate this a little bit more about why do we think that inflammation might be uh, the root of this. And so we know a lot about the lung and the heart effects, um, but there's several studies that, in that um, indicate that inflammation occurs and that these cytokines uh, get out into circulation, cytokines like IL-8, IL-6, um, these have all been measured following uh, smoke exposure in wildland firefighters. So if we take their blood, we're seeing an uptick in these inflammatory factors. And so we think then that um, this inflammation might be spilling over into circulation. Once in circulation, you have access to all of these other uh, tissues. So what do we know uh, if we focus in on reproductive effects um, what do we know from the air pollution literature? Uh, so just general air pollution, not wildfire smoke, more like think more like um, urban air pollution, things like traffic related pollution or industrial pollution. Well, this evidence is very inconsistent and it probably has a lot to do with the way that these studies are conducted. But we've seen from the literature that air pollution has been associated with DNA damage, ep uh, aberrant epigenetics, low sperm concentration, um, and some of the mechanisms that have been proposed are hormon hormonal disturbances, oxidative stress, and epigenetic alterations. Now, if we look at some empirical evidence 
focused on re reproductive health, um, we can see from the urban particulate literature that we see decreases in sperm quality. So this has been shown in, um, in US populations, in Chinese populations, and it's also been shown in animal populations. Moving to wildfire smoke specifically, there was a really interesting study that took advantage of sperm donation clinics in the Portland, uh, Oregon uh, um, area. What they did was they, they went and they asked the sperm donation clinic to identify people who came in uh, consistently and donated. And then they looked at those uh, samples uh, before a wildfire smoke exposure to the community and then after a wildfire smoke exposure to the community. And they found that those consistent donors had uh, lower concentrations following a smoke exposure. So kind of a messy study uh, in that, you know, there's we don't know much about what the other exposures in their life might have been, but a pretty good, um, uh, you know, first look or first pass at, at whether or not this may be uh, possible. Now, there's been some studies looking at firefighters, structure firefighters, and their reproductive um, health. These studies didn't do a very good job of, of looking at smoke exposure specifically. They looked more at just, were you a firefighter? And then what happened when you stopped being a firefighter? And they showed that when these firefighters went, uh, when they left the field, uh, their, their fertility improved. So these were people who were dealing with fertility issues while being a firefighter, but then when they left the field, uh, their fertility uh, improved. And so it's not clear, you know, it could be a lot of things about being a firefighter that could be influencing that, but it, it goes to suggest that smoke may be uh, one of the factors. There's also some anecdotal evidence. Uh, this is a magazine article that a journalist went out and uh, interviewed both women and men firefighters and found that they perceive uh, an, a potential issue of smoke exposure um, or being a firefighter more generally, uh, and their reproductive health. And so this is an interesting sort of um, insight into that community. It goes to say that maybe these folks will be more um, willing to participate in a study looking at reproductive health if they do indeed perceive a problem. So now I'm going to talk to you about one of the pilot studies that we've recently ran. Uh, and what we did was we wanted to model an occupational exposure, a wild and firefighter exposure using a mouse model with the idea that if inflammation is the root of this and that inflammation spills over after an exposure, that maybe it does the same thing in a mouse. And we would use an epigenetic technique as a biomarker to look at the impact of sort of the smoke-induced inflammatory cascade that may be happening um, because that cascade may be short-lived, but the epigenetic mark may be more sustained. So the model that we, or the paradigm here that we use, um, and this is all being done at Northeastern University with colleagues that I have there. Um, what they do is they take Douglas fir needles and they burn them in this quartz tube environment, produce smoke, uh, under a smoldering condition. Uh, so I said earlier that the fire conditions determine a lot of what's produced. And so you get more smoke and less gas uh, when you do a smoldering fire. So we're around 450 degrees Celsius. Um, and what we're trying to produce is around 20 milligrams per meter cubed um, for two hours a day for a four month, or excuse me, a four um a 40 day uh, exposure. Um, we have a couple different paradigms. We have a two month exposure, a four month exposure, and this particular one was a 40 day exposure. Um, and what, we, what we're modeling here based on deposition calculations is a firefighter's lung deposition of particulate matter for 10 years of service. We're exposing mice to that same level in about 40 days. And so uh, that's for those of you who are wondering, you know, how do we model an occupational exposure? That's that's the calculations that were done here. And it takes into account the the lung volume of a mouse, the respiration rate of a mouse, and then compares it to uh, a human. And so a 40 day exposure 
We had control mice. We had exposed mice. We're using an APOE uh, knockout model, which is an environmentally susceptible model. Uh, very good for studying cardiovascular disease, which is what my colleagues were really interested in. So they were really the, the drivers of, of choosing this model. So for those of you um, who are write, write, feverishly writing down questions about why did I choose the APOE model, it, it wasn't really my choice. Uh, I'm, I'm using these samples because they were available um, and uh, they were looking at cardiovascular outcomes, which APOE uh, knockout mice are really good for. Um, and so the type of epigenetic uh, technique that we're going to use is reduced representation by sulfite sequencing, which uses a combination of restriction enzymes and by sulfite sequencing, which takes advantage of the idea that um, unprotected cytosines or unmethylated cytosines uh, are, are altered using this by sulfite uh, sequencing, whereas the methylated cytosines are protected. And because of that, we're able to distinguish between the two. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is that if uh, the, the reduced representation uh, by sulfite sequencing, it's reduced representation, meaning it's not a, ho a whole genome sequence. It's looking in specific areas. A lot of areas are represented. Um, and so you see across this chart here that promoter regions, exons, introns, uh, repetitive elements are all uh, represented, but they're not represented necessarily in, in the same uh, way. Uh, we've, we're representing a lot more promoter regions, for example, than repetitive elements. But these are the typical profiles that you'll see. Uh, so methylation is on the left there on the y-axis. And so we see that promoters are typically unmethylated, and that's because promoter regions are typically, uh, or that, that area of the genome is near a gene that we want to be turned on. So it would make sense that those are, are more often lowly methylated, whereas repetitive elements are uh, gene regions that we want to be um, turned off. Uh, those have uh, 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 bad uh, or potentially bad uh, sequences in them that can uh, move around the genome and uh, cause problems. And so we want those to be uh, uh, methylated so that they're not able to, to, to do that. And so we see that they're uh, more highly, uh, highly methylated. So what happened when we uh, sort of took a 30,000 foot view at just uh, the methylation patterns of these two groups of mice, what happened in a PCA pot or a plot or a cluster diagram was really interesting. Uh, we see in this two-dimensional representation of, um, of, of variants that uh, these uh, P principal components uh, separated the two groups pretty well. Uh, and, and I've circled those in red and black uh, with, let me move my picture here, with the red being the control and the black being exposed. And similarly, uh, we see that the clade diagram here shows that they cluster really well uh, together. Uh, so that gave us an, an initial indication that, um, that the methylation was important uh, following the, this exposure. And so... When we looked at uh, the RBS data, uh, one of the first ways that we looked at it in panel A is with a heat map. And what we wanted to see, again, this is a sperm collected from these mice post-mortem. Uh, one group is exposed, one group is control. These are sperm DNA methylation profiles. So we're not expecting that they're going to be wildly changed. They still have the profile of a sperm. But you can see if you look close on the left-hand side that the, that the pattern has actually changed. The blue is a little bit lighter blue. The red is a little bit lighter red. And what we can show with the violin plot in panel B is what we've done is we've taken these uh, the sperm DNA methylation pattern, which uh, which uh, kind of nicely separated into these two modes, a hypo hyper methylated mode, so up around 100% DNA methylation, uh, with methylation there on the y axis, 100% uh, methylation is all the way at the top, 0% methylation is at the bottom. We have the second mode, that hypo methylated mode at the bottom, and it's the bigger mode, so we have more hypo methylated uh, uh, regions. Um, than hypermethylated. And what we've done with the smoke exposure is compress that. The hypomethylated move to the middle, the hypermethylated move to the middle. And this is very, very interesting to us. Um, and so what we get overall, because we have more hypomethylated genes, is we have a, mo uh, a more hypermethylated phenotype, or we shifted overall methylation uh, up a little bit. 
And it did this not in one specific area, but across the entire um, epigenome. And we can see that from the circus plot. Um, anywhere that you see a, a, a blue uh, tick mark is essentially a change that occurred on any one of the uh, chromosomes that are represented there uh, for the mouse. So we had um, over 3,000 differentially methylated regions with 79% of those being hypermethylated. And that, that data is there represented in those bullet points below. So all of that is to say that we saw a methylation change, a very robust DNA methylation cha change in the sperm of mice that were exposed to smoke. But the question that I, I want you all to be thinking about and I, I hope that you're asking yourself, is this so what? What, is that? what does that mean if you're a wildland firefighter? Or if you're a member of the community and you're thinking wildland firefighters may be the canary in the coal mine that are kind of previewing what we in the community might be um, uh, looking at in, future, in the future if we become heavily exposed uh, similar to the wildland firefighters. Well, one of the things that we're really interested to understand is, is this persistent? What happens if you take the smoke away and you let the mice go through another spermatogenesis cycle? Would these epigenetic changes stick around? Um, is the epigenetic change biologically relevant? Does it actually change the fertility of, of the mouse? Or can we translate this to humans and does it change the fertility of, of humans? Um, are we changing the, the epigenome so much that there's maybe some type of evolutionary process where the sperm go through apoptosis and uh, remove themselves from the sperm population. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we're seeing um, low sperm count in folks who are exposed to air pollution more broadly. I showed you some of that data. And then we showed you that one study from Portland that was a sort of a surface level suggestion that um, sperm concentrations may be going down. Um, these are all questions that we need to answer so that we can um, really get at this, so what? And if we if we do find out uh, that smoke influences fertility, what what would we do about it? What type of recommendations would we provide to these firefighters? Perhaps one of the things that we would say is, you know, this is um, uh, insights into family planning for firefighters. Maybe it's better for firefighters to family plan outside of the fire season. Um, and and wildland firefighters may be able to take advantage of the fact that um, they they are mostly fighting fire for four to six months out of the year, and then the rest of the time um, they're not. And so maybe that's a better time for family planning. So here's some considerations to think about as we move forward with these studies: is we do have some evidence that aberrant DNA methylation is associated with infertility, so that is plausible. Um, but epigenetic inheritance across organisms, while plausible, is, content, is contested. Um, and so we have some evidence for recently from wildfire exposures in uh, rats and also in um, primates that suggests that uh, there may be some evidence for cross-organism uh, effects. But one of the things I wanted to show you is, is um, there's a huge difference between intergenerational effects and transgenerational effects. And we need to be really careful with our wording here. Um, transgenerational effects means we're, we're seeing um, an epigenetic effect that actually is not caused by a direct exposure. And so one of the things that we, we know from the literature is if we look at um, epigenetics across organisms, we go through these erasures. And it's highly unlikely, possible, but highly unlikely that these exposure-induced changes in the sperm would actually survive the erasure that, it, that, that the sperm goes through um, as the sperm has to forget everything it knows about itself epigenetically to help contribute to the formation of a zygote, which then needs to go on and be able to form all of the different, you know, billions of cells in your body. We can't have it remembering what it was like to be a sperm. It needs to, it needs to now be pluripotent and be able to become a lung cell or a heart cell, or in this case, maybe another germ cell in the future uh, for that for that next offspring. And so these are the reasons why this is um, this is contested. Um, and I, I have another couple stories to tell, but because we're running a little bit low on time. 
the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and I'm going to skip kind of to the end, is how are we going to pilot this in a human cohort study? And one of the things I wanted to show you that we're really excited about is we don't necessarily need firefighters to come home from uh, fighting fires. They, they oftentimes work 10 to 14 days in a row. They only get two days to spend with their families. And we're, we're not going to ask them to drive all the way across town and spend hours in, in a fertility clinic or in a, a urologic clinic. We can send them a home, a an at-home test kit that they can do in the convenience and privacy of their own home. This is just one example, the Yo uh, uh, test kit, which actually has this really neat Bluetooth device, which Bluetooths to your phone. And uh, I wanted to show you an example of what you can get with this. So this individual tested uh, their sperm, found out that they have uh, over 6 million modal sperm, which put them into the green category. They got a Yo score, which is in increments of 10 from 10 to 100. They got a Yo score of 90. So that means that they're highly likely to be fertile. And this thing also has a little... Um, microscope inside, which gives you this, hopefully that video is working for you all, gives you this really neat video of your sperm in real time. Um, and so this is a great tool for these firefighters and one that we hope to be able to use um, to collect information on their fertility, but also to have them then send us those samples uh, via USPS uh, because we're studying DNA, we don't necessarily need it to be temperature controlled. They can send us their samples, we can extract DNA, and we can do some of the same studies that we did in the mice. Uh, we can do that in the humans and find out if they uh, have um, epigenetic differences um, and use them use the firefighter as their own control. So do a preseason, um, do a preseason sample, and then do a during season sample. So that, that's that's what we're really excited about doing this coming year, uh, this coming fire season. Um, so what about other extra pulmonary tissues? I have some information here about wh why we're also interested in the brain. We did this recent review. I'd invite you to go read this. Uh, I have a really uh, great graduate student who looked at the influence of wildfire smoke and uh, particulate matter on Alzheimer's disease. Um, these are some of the questions that we're hoping to answer um, in his dissertation and maybe also in his postdoc that he might do with me at Colorado State University. Um, and then I just wanted to briefly show you guys that we do some research uh, in the field looking at uh, outdoor to indoor infiltration. Um, we found some really neat data in skilled nursing facilities showing that skilled nursing facilities, while you may think you're safe inside, the smoke can go can get inside um, and uh, and all facilities aren't created equal. Different facilities can be impacted in different ways, which tells us that there might be things that we can do to help modify the outdoor to indoor infiltration. A little uh, message here on the right about conducting animal studies in the West during wildfire season. The smoke gets inside animal facilities as well. Some really interesting data that we did uh, during COVID uh, looking at um, the animal facility at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. Work with some public health students to uh, understand perceptions of, of smoke exposure in the community and help people understand how they can be more healthy. And we're also doing some uh, data collection and modeling related to um, low-cost monitors and how low-cost monitors can be used to help uh, people understand their outdoor to indoor infiltration rates. Um, and then this last uh, project that a student did, I just wanted to show you that, you know, regulatory monitors across the West are sparse. Each one of the little green dots is a regulatory monitor and uh, that shows that we can really build a more robust network if we think about low cost monitors. Each one of the red dots or red flags is a skilled nursing facility, a place where uh, elderly people who have comorbidities live who really need good air quality data to understand whether or not they're at risk. And you can see that every red flag is a facility that's outside of a 50 mile radius from a regulatory unit. So it really goes to show that we could do, be doing more uh, with low cost monitors to help those facilities understand uh, their risk. And the last thing I wanted to say is three years ago, I started a wildfire smoke symposium. We've had great turnout every year. This year is no different. Uh, we're having a, a symposium on November 14th. The theme is building community resilience. 
students in the audience know that the registration is free for that. So if you type in Rocky Mountain Wildfire Smoke Symposium in a Google search, it should come up. You can also go to boisestate.edu slash C-E-E-H-S, um, and you'll be able to find information on this. Great keynote speaker from uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Kwok from NIEHS will be there, um, and we're going to be talking about uh, the the, the uh, topics there in those bullet points. And so um, I'll leave that up for just a second if you want to find that information, but that's my last slide. And with that, I'd love to take some questions. Great. Thank you very much. For, this is very uh, interesting and um, and uh, you, you cover uh, from exposure through you know, molecular level uh, animal model studies. So um, this is very uh, exciting. So we have a couple of questions from uh, Q&A. And so the, uh, look, if you uh, can see, uh, if we are not able to see the Q&A, so then I will just read the question, okay? Um, the first question uh, from David uh, Benzamin. So have you found or looked for changes to the microbiome in human subject and the microbiome in the soil in the environment where there has occurred severe smoke events? So that is outside of my wheelhouse uh, a little bit, but I know that that research um, is going on uh, and that the microbiome uh, and the interplay between the microbiome and general health, especially as it relates to infl uh, systemic inflammation, is really, really uh, important. And I would assume that one's microbiome would be a factor that we would want to take into consideration when we think about resilience. And I would guess that there's certain characteristics of your microbiome that may uh, help you uh, fight off uh, the type of inflammation that would occur following an exposure and some that would leave you more susceptible. But uh, that's that's all I want to comment on that. It's a little bit outside my wheelhouse, but thank you for the question. Good. Okay. The second question from uh, Beck Petrov. So thanks for a great talk. I don't mind at all. You had an APOE knockout, but which APOE was it? If humanized three, four, so E3, four, are there any data on behavior and any plans to look at the brain? Um, yeah, so you probably wrote that question before I got to my brain slides. Um, we, we did collect the brains from all of those mice. Um, this is actually, let me take a quick second before I answer that question to, to give a plug to the students who are getting ready to transition to independent labs. When you start a lab, it can be very difficult and overwhelming to think about doing your own studies, exposing animals, collecting samples. Don't be afraid to reach out. Send a cold email or a cold phone call to a, coll a potential collaborator. That's what I did at the uh, Northeastern University. And it turns out that they were using these mice uh, for heart and lung related studies and they had no plans for any of the other tissues. And so through that, email that I sent them, we created this collaboration. And now from all of their mice, I'm getting uh, brain and sperm uh, and able to do my studies without, at this point, without actually having to expose my own mice. So definitely going to be looking at the brain. Um, and these are not humanized APOE knockout or APOE mice. Um, but in the future, we would like to look at some uh, Alzheimer's model uh, mice and see whether or not uh, these smoke exposures do influence uh, Alzheimer's related uh, uh, pa pathogenesis. Does it exacerbate things like um, Alzheimer's disease development of uh, plaques or tau bodies? And then 100% uh, agree with you that we also need to connect that to behavioral uh, data and evidence. Do these actually have biological ramifications? Do these changes, these uh, smoke-induced changes in uh, Alzheimer's disease risk actually uh, infer some change in, you know, water maze uh, time or uh, roto rod or any of the behavioral tests that we can do to 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 look at um, Alzheimer's-related pathogenesis uh, in a mouse. We we definitely want to do that. So thank you for that question. Good. Yeah, so. Uh... After I cover another question and then so actually I want to have a uh, like a follow-up question about that. So 
the question from Dana Dalinoy. So welcome back, Luke. It's so great to see the evolution of your research from sales to society. Congrats on all these great projects. Is there any plans to use wildlife in, in this study? Not sure, but perhaps non-invasive work could be done with thicker sample epigenetics. A really, really interesting question. Um, I know that there's, so your question is about wildlife. I know that there's, being that I'm at Colorado State University now, I know there's a lot of interest in understanding how this influences a One Health perspective. So things like cattle, um, there's been a lot of work understanding how uh, systemic inflammation in cows during smoke events may influence their milk production, for example. So thinking about that, we completely recognize that smoke may be influencing these large megafauna. And so are they are they having an influence on the deer population or the elk population? And I think a non-invasive technique to be able to do that, getting back to the person who asked about the microbiome, wouldn't it be really cool to go out and collect uh, fecal samples from a known exposed area, uh, you know, and and find DNA, uh, excuse me, find uh, deer feces and look at microbiome or look at um, DNA methylation. Uh, really, really great study idea. I don't have any plans to do that, but if someone wants to, you know, team up and do that, I would uh, I would be all all open for that. Especially if it gets me out into the mountains a little bit more, I would love that. Great. Okay. So then, so. Uh... Anyone, because we have uh, a few more minutes, so if you have question, oh, we got just got one question. Um, uh, question from uh, Ken Escher. So I'm a firefighter, paramedic, uh, and study public health. From our fire department, uh, department run reviews, we have exposure data. Are there currently studies comparing the occupation? So, Occupational exposure data to long-term pathogenesis. So this is near and dear to my heart. I really appreciate this question. So thinking about long-term cohort studies is something that I'm doing a lot uh, uh, right now with, um, especially with this new uh, Department of the Interior group that I'm that I was invited to to collaborate with. For structure firefighters, I would point you to the research. Uh, you have a great researcher, actually, a research contact in EHS. Uh, so J uh, Jackie Goodrich is involved with a larger group consortium uh, ran by Jeff Burgess uh, and Kenny Fint uh, at CDC. Uh, these folks are all involved in structure firefighter long-term health, and they created a cancer uh, registry where any structure firefighter can uh, volunteer to be part of this cancer registry. And they look at things other than cancer, but camp cancer was the impetus for this. Recently, uh, that group also opened up a, a new facet of the cancer registry specific to recruiting wildland firefighters. And I am trying desperately to become a, a part of that consortium because I really am interested in following these folks long-term and I think understanding, for example, reproductive health effects, we can really only do that in a robust way if we have a cohort that we study for multiple uh, multiple years and perhaps multiple generations. Um, and so very interesting question. Uh, this, this work is just beginning. One other thing I'll say about this is you might ask yourself, wildland firefighters are uh, federally funded uh, workers. We, we know from other research areas that federally funded researchers, government employees are really closely monitored. Why have we not been closely monitoring this particular type of government employee? And it's because they've been traditionally seasonal employees who were not afforded the same type of benefits that other types of government employees are. However, that all just changed with the new infrastructure bill where there was money set aside to uh, bring a lot of those seasonal employees on as permanent employees. What that's done is created an impetus for the federal government now to study the long-term health of these wild and firefighters, because now the federal government is on the hook for their health because they're no longer seasonal employees, they're, they're permanent federal employees. So this is a turning point uh, for this area of research. So thank you for the question and being able to elaborate on that a little bit. 
Okay, so then so uh, it's almost time. So let's take the one last question. Uh, question by Ernie King. So have you found cases where smoke has a good effect on anything or is it all negative? So I posted something on Twitter recently, which you guys should all follow me on Twitter if, if you're on there, um, at Luke Montrose. I posted something on there and one of my colleagues, uh, also an environmental toxicologist, PhD trained at uh, the University of Montana, now working for the American Lung Association, she asked that exact same question. She said, why is it always assumed that an environmental exposure like smoke is going to have a negative effect and shouldn't we be more agnostic with our hypotheses about the uh, the impact. And so I don't know off the cuff that I can point to an example uh, where smoke exposure is necessarily good, but I know from the cigarette smoke literature that under certain circumstances, certain studies have found that smoking cigarettes, for example, can be good in like very specific circumstances. So is it possible that for a certain outcome, a certain population of people, that smoke exposure is good, it's possible. Um, I will just say one interesting thing about this, um, the reproductive health literature that I've found uh, with the male uh, reproduction that I find very interesting, and it is a little bit uh, removed from your question, but uh, what the body may actually be doing uh, when the air pollution exposure occurs and we see this drop in concentration of sperm. I find it fascinating that there's been a few folks who've actually said that that's an evolutionary trick essentially for our bodies to say, maybe now's not the best time for reproduction. Let's wait for better times. Essentially, we may have evolved a trick to downplay or downregulate our sperm concentrations uh, during periods of environmental instability. And once that environmental instability is over, a fire is, is over, for example, our sperm rebound, and now we may have a more viable, more evolutionarily strong uh, offspring. Just a hypothesis that I've read in the literature, but uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. And so that sort of gets at your question in a, in a roundabout way. So thank you for that. Okay, great. Thank you, Rose. So it's now 12.53, so we have to uh, end this uh, seminar. So thank you, Dr. Montrose, for a great talk and then uh, your uh, answer to the question. And thank you for uh, joining this uh, the seminar. So we will have uh, next uh, seminar, uh, which will happen in two weeks by uh, Dr. Sarah Adar. So I uh, hope to see you again uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye and have a great day. Thank you all.